talking about a very interesting topic today, Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. So, without further ado, let's begin this prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing all this together today. This microphone's not working super well. Sorry about the call. And we thank you for bringing us together today. Please bless Paul's, Father Paul's job. And please help us all to gaze next. We'll get a new microphone in a moment. So anyway, we hope this up, Heavenly Father, as we pray. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, while somebody is who's working on, on the microphone, can I have somebody do this? Thank you. The slides. I'm just going to speak like this until I get the microphone ready, uh, because I also have the noon mass or the 11 o'clock mass. I want to make sure we get through everything. So just talking about the topic about Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. Um, just making sure we're talking, uh, just a basic understanding is the Ark of the Covenant was the box that when uh, the Israelites were going through the wilderness, it held the presence of God. They believed that God dwelled in that box can you hear me? Good. All right, great. The God dwelt in that box and accompanied uh, the Israelites through the desert, and then eventually that was what the box that was held in the Holy of the Holies in the temple, because they believed that the box held the very presence of God. So just by, as a very basic starting point, when we're talking about Mary being the Ark of the Covenant, what we're saying is that Mary's womb held the very presence of God, so can we start talking about Mary as the Ark of the Covenant? And what I want to make clear is that when you start going through the Gospels, especially Luke's Gospel, it's not just something that we can talk about like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. It's no, every choice that Luke made when he was talking about Jesus' early years was trying to show how Mary was the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus is the very presence of God that it contained. And this is just not an accident. So, um, let's go to the next slide here. So just we're going to start by doing a history of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box created under the supervision of Moses, which marked the presence of God as he traveled with the Israelites through the desert. So Exodus 25 talks about the building of the Ark. And we don't have pictures of the Ark, but we do have um, like these you know, very detailed descriptions of how the Ark was made and what it looked like. The ark held three things. It held a golden pot in which the manna was stored. The manna was the, 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 uh, the, the bread that was fed the Israelites in the desert. By the way, an easy symbol of Christ. Uh, then you had Aaron's priestly staff or rod. So what they did was that they took, um, he had this rod, and all of the other heads of the tribes put their rods like down, and Aaron's was the one that flowered. And so it was the idea, understanding that he, it, it was his tribe and his descendants which would be the priestly cast of Israel. Well, Jesus was also a priest. That's the whole thing about him dying on the cross, that he was from the priestly class. And then, of course, the, uh, the tablets of the covenant, so the Ten Commandments. Well, who gave the Ten Commandments? That was also, you know, Jesus gave the Ten Commandments. So those were the three things held in the box. But when not walking, so when the, the Jews were traveling and they were resting, the ark was stored in the tent of meeting, and the tent, the word for tent in Hebrew is tabernacle. We get our word for tabernacle from, from that, and that also makes sense because the tabernacle was in the Holy of Holies, the very center of the temple, where the presence of God was stored. And so why do we call that box in church the tabernacle? Well, it's for the same reason. It's the center of our church. And it's where the presence of God is held. So that's why we call it a tabernacle. But so the ark would be stored in the tent of meeting in which Moses would then speak out to God face to face. It said that Moses would enter the tent and everybody would be standing and looking as he'd be entering in because Moses is about to get uh, talk to God face to face. And they said when he came out, his face would be radiant with light such that he had to cover his face because otherwise people would be like, you know, having to block their face in order to, you know, because they have to squint too hard. 
So the whole idea that was that the tent of meeting was literally the face of God, um, you know, uh, that Moses was speaking with. Next slide. Okay. Uh, the next that we hear about the ark is that, you know, they, the Jews have made it into the promised land, and they're, they're trying to clear the holy land out from all of these other tribes. And in this particular um, fight with the Philistines, they, the Jews were not doing too well. And so they decided, well, you know what? The Ark of the Covenant really helped us when we were out in the desert to win all sorts of battles and things. Why don't we bring the Ark of the Covenant here? Um, except that it was not asked for by God or anything like that. They kind of did this on their own volition, their own will, and God wasn't very pleased with this. The Israelites wound up losing the battle, and the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, um, and they held it hostage. So, of course, if you have the very presence of God and you've lost it, that's a big problem, and the, the Israelites were just in a panic about this. However, um, the Philistines then had a whole series of really bad things happen to them. They, were, they felt like that they were being cursed. Everybody who wound up getting the ark wound up you know, having somebody die or get sick or boils or cancer and everything. And eventually what ended up happening was they were like, just take it back. So they wound up then giving it back uh, to the Israelites, and it stayed in the house of a man named Abinadab, and this was all throughout the reign of King Saul. And then it just remained in that household until King David took on his reign. Next slide. Okay, then, this is a very important scene in the Bible, these two verses, uh, chapters of the Bible, 2 Samuel 6 and then later 2 Samuel 7, extremely important, not just for the Ark of the Covenant, but just for scripture in general, for prophecies about the coming of Christ. Um, David decided it wasn't fitting to have uh, the Ark resting in just the house of Abinadab, so he started trying to bring it back to Jerusalem, to the, the, the home city. Um, and so what he does is that he, he has it brought, you know, that you can imagine that there's four guys that, you know, like, you know, like a, a, a pier or a beer, and they're like carrying it on, one on each shoulder, and they're carrying the ark, and, and David is going in front of the ark. Well, one of the oxen that was like leading the way, it, they stumble, and some guy, one of the guys who was holding it, his name is Uzzah, he winds up like trying to steady the ark to catch it, but you're not supposed to touch the ark. It's, it's sacred. It's set apart for sacred use. And so when he touched it, just to show that this is sacred and it's to be touched by no man, by the way, we're going to get into this later, why did this whole, whole thing happen? Who also was not touched by any man? Mary was not touched by any man. Get it? All right. So she, he goes and touches the ark, falls down dead, and David then says these words. He says, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? And it's his way of saying, this is too sacred, this is too holy. And so what he does is that he sends it to the house of Obed, into the hill country of Judea, and he, there it remains for three months. I want you to remember all of those facts, because they're going to come up later. The words, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? He sent it to the hill country of Judea, and it remained there for three months. You're going to hear about this again later. Okay, then what happened was, over the next three months, Obed's house, where uh, Rebain, uh, was highly blessed, you know, all sorts of great things were happening, to the point where David said, these blessings cannot just simply be given to one, uh, one person. And so he then says, this time I'm going to do it right. So what he did was that he dressed basically in a loincloth, which was priestly robes at the time, you know, for what was going on. So he's dressing like a priest. And he is dancing in front of the ark the entire way, and he is shouting these loud shouts, and every six steps or so, they would make a sacrifice, and then they would you know, keep doing that whole thing until they brought it back to, the, it's, to Jerusalem. And what ended up happening um, and when they brought it back into Jerusalem is that they put it at the first in the tent of meeting. They set that up again in the same tent that was being held, that the, the, the ark was traveling in the desert with. And they said at that time, by the way, is that there was a gate, it was the eastern gate, which is the one that's closest to, um, to the house of Obed, that it was facing east, which is, was, is called the Gate of Solomon, and that gate was then closed at that point, and it was closed because the ark had passed through, the presence of God had passed through, and so that gate was considered sacred. Nothing else was allowed to pass through that gate until the Messiah came. And that was when Jesus proceeds into Jerusalem. That's the gate that he comes through. 
because only the presence of God is allowed to pass through that gate. Very interesting. Okay, but then what ended up happening was, next slide, the next chapter is also very important. Oh, actually, and I saw, I, I, I gave two Samuel 6 here. I just explained all of this, but it's one of those things I was planning on reading it, and well, I explained it anyway. So we'll just move on to the next slide. Okay, then um, what ends up happening is, I, I have the artist lost, but there, I have two things on one slide. It's the first thing is that um, in 2 Samuel 7, this is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. Because David, then, he, he sees that he's living in this beautiful house of cedar, and yet he sees that the ark is being stored in this tent. So he says to the prophet Nathan, he says, look, I want to build a house for our Lord to dwell in. And uh, he, Nathan essentially comes back and says, no, it's going to happen during the, the reign of your son Solomon. He can build the temple uh, because your hands are too filled with blood from conquest and everything like that. This needs to be done by hands that are clean. But at this time, several things happen. Is first of all, you have this promise that the temple is going to be made, that's going to store the, the presence of God. Um, but then what um, uh, uh, Nathan says to uh, David is he makes a promise to David and to all the future kings of Israel. And the promises are two, is that from your line, um, somebody is going to be sitting on the throne of Israel forever. And that person, by the way, that prophecy is, it's a, it's a prophecy about the Messiah, it's a prophecy about the coming of Christ. But then the second thing that's promised is that, and I will be as a father to him, and he will be a son to me. That promise, by the way, we're so used to it because, as we prayed at the very beginning, we prayed the Our Father, and we're so used to calling God Our Father that we don't realize that calling God Our Father was something that was, throughout most of the Old Testament, unheard of. Nobody called God their father. The, the person who was allowed to call God father, their father first was the king of Israel, and that's it. Later, it got extended a little bit more into other people before Christ came, but no, with the calling God our Father was a, uh, that was a strict, uh, strictly allowed by the king of Israel. And isn't that an amazing prophecy when you see it later, is that the king of Israel, who Christ what later was, and also the Son of God, who Christ also was, they all meet together in, in Christ himself. All of those prophecies are fulfilled. So what ends up happening then is that this promise is made, Solomon builds the temple, and the temple remains for about 400 years until the Babylonians come in. They, uh, they, it's the Babylonian exile, so they conquer the city of Jerusalem. They take all of the kingly court and all the people, and they, they, they transport them to Babylon because you, if you have a people that's not in their home city, they're much less likely to rebel because they're completely dependent on the people that they're living with, and so they didn't want them to rebel. They exiled all the entire Israelite uh, people to Babylon. They destroyed the temple, and this is the point where the ark is lost from history. So even after the Babylonian exile, the uh, Israelites, they returned back to Jerusalem. They rebuilt the, uh, temple, uh, the, the city of Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple. It's a much smaller, less grand temple than the, the first one was. And also... The temple lacks the Ark of the Covenant. It lacks the very presence of God. And that's where the way it remained for the next uh, 500 years. Next slide. So the whole thing is, when you're leading up to then the New Testament, it's this idea that the Ark is lost, the temple is empty. But we begin our story, and by the way, you're never going to see Luke's gospel the same way after this, because this is not just a story that I'm coming up with. Every decision that Luke makes when he is talking about Jesus is the first 12 years of his life has to do with showing that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus is the presence of God. It begins uh, Luke's story in Luke 1, and he is, um, it begins, and of all places, with uh, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, and where does it begin? In the Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark was supposed to be, but is no longer because it's been lost. And it was probably the Feast of Yom Kippur, and because the head priest, was a, that was the one time that they were so anybody was allowed into the Holy of Holies, and he was supposed to, you know, like incense the place and everything, and then that was the one moment where he was allowed to say in a whisper in the name of God, Yahweh. 
And there's several different things happen. But so anyway, he's in the ark. It's his turn that year, and he's doing his thing. And then the angel Gabriel appears to him. And the angel Gabriel at that point tells him that um, even though his wife has been barren, she's going to have a child and everything like that. And uh, John and Zechariah doesn't believe him and everything. He's struck mute for nine months. And in the meantime, by the way, just to let you know, before he opens his mouth and speaks again, he has gotten to see Mary, the Ark of the Covenant. She came and visited in the hill country of Judea, if those words sound familiar from earlier in my talk. What ends up happening is that when his mouth is finally opened, he makes a prophecy. He says something about John the Baptist. He says, you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. David went before the Lord in the ark to prepare his way. When he was dancing in front of the ark, when he was shouting in front of the ark, who was it that went in front of the ark? It was it was. David. And so John the Baptist is like the forerunner. He is the one who is going in front of the ark, going in front of Jesus to prepare his way, like King David did. Next slide. Okay, the Annunciation. Six months into Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, at which time Mary says those famous words, let it be done to me according to thy word. And she conceives Jesus in her womb, and it's said in uh, Luke's Gospel that the Holy Spirit will overshadow her. And those words overshadow are really significant because in Exodus 40, 34, we understand that that same word overshadowed is used of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, what the Ark of the Covenant was held in, when Moses would go in and speak face to face with God. It would say that a cloud would come down and it would overshadow the tent of meeting. And that was the presence of God coming down. And so the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow Mary, just like did she, uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit overshadowed the tent of meeting, just like it overshadowed the Ark of the Covenant within. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant carried the presence of God. God now, God now dwells within the womb of the Virgin Mary. Next slide. Okay, and then here, by the way, um, also in the words of the angel Gabriel, remember I said that there were two promises made to King David, is that one of the sons would sit on the throne of uh, David, uh, on that throne forever, and that he would be a son to the father. Look at the words that the angel Gabriel then speaks to Mary about her child here. It's, he will be great when we call the Son of the Most High. I will be his father, and he will be my son, according to Samuel. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And this is the promise made to David. When God, David asked God if he could build the temple to, the, uh, to house the ark, God made the following promises to David. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. These amazing connections we have between the building of the temple, David being called, uh, allowed, being allowed to call God his father, and God calling him his son, and then this promise about the, the, per, the, the perpetual reign of the kings of David, they all come together in these few verses of the Bible, and they're all being brought up again in a brief period of time in Luke's gospel when the angel Gabriel appears. It's calling to mind in every single one of these things. Next slide. And this is where it's, uh, once you start getting into the visitation when Mary goes to meet Elizabeth, any doubt that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus is the presence of God within is just, it's put to rest. Because then what, here's what happens is that uh, the angel Gabriel tells Mary that Elizabeth is six months pregnant, so Mary goes in haste to the hill country of Judea. Where is that? That is within walking distance of where Obed lived. Obed was the man that when the, um, after David had said, who am I that the ark of the Lord should come to me? And he like shifted off to uh, the house of the hill country of Judea. Obed is the place where he that was living and they're within walking distance of one another. And so next slide. I want you to then compare side by side to Samuel, where the ark is being that whole process of transporting it home, with all of these different words 
that, um, that Elizabeth and Mary are speaking to one another. The ark traveled to the house of Obed in the hill country of Judea. Mary traveled to the house of Elizabeth and Zechariah in the hill country of Judea. Dressed as a priest, David danced and leapt in front of the ark. John the Baptist, a priestly lineage, leapt in his mother's womb at the approach of Mary. When, the, the, when your words came to my ear, the infant in my womb leapt for joy. Okay, and then remember the words of, John, uh, of uh, Zechariah, his father. You, my child, should be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way. You wonder what he was doing when he was being struck mute for those nine months, is that he was witnessing the coming of the Ark of the Covenant to his house, and everybody in Jesus' family who saw that understood exactly what was going on. David then asks, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Elizabeth asks, uh, Mary, why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? David shouts in the presence of the ark, and Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry in the presence of Mary. The ark then remained in the house of Obed for three months. Well, we said that Elizabeth was six months pregnant at that point, and Mary is basically staying with her for three months to help her basically deliver John the Baptist. She's there to help her, her, um, her cousin. She was there for three months. It remained in the hill country of Judea for three months. This is stopping, this is no longer coincidence, people. The house of Obed was greatly blessed by the presence of the ark, and Elizabeth says the word three times. She says, how blessed I am. Uh, 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 I can't remember her words that she says, but you can look at it, and she uses the word blessed three times. If you know how Hebrew works, you have an adjective, like good. If you want to say better, which is the comparative, you say good, good in Hebrew. And if you want to say the best or the superlative, you say good, good, good together. So if somebody is greatly blessed or maximally blessed or very blessed, you would say blessed, blessed, blessed. And Elizabeth says that three times, referring to the visit of Mary coming to her house, carrying the presence of God. And then finally, the ark returns to its home and ends up in Jerusalem, where God's presence and glory is revealed in the temple. We're going to cover this very shortly, but you're going to start looking at Mary when she comes and presents Jesus in the temple. It, it takes on entirely different meaning if you realize that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant, and Jesus is the very presence of God. Next slide. Okay, that's exactly what we're talking about. The presentation of the child Jesus in the temple. So this is, it's 33 days after uh, a woman had given birth. It was her job, she was considered ritually unclean, so she was not allowed to enter the, uh, the temple because, you know, anytime there was blood involved, you, you weren't allowed to touch it or anything like that. It was ritually unclean. You had to wait certain periods of time after interacting with blood in order to go in the temple. Of course, after you get birth, there's lots of blood and things. So 33 days later, they were supposed to come in and present their child in the temple. But this, of course, was very important because it was the firstborn child. Um, and so they came into the temple, and they had this prophet Simeon who was told, he was an old man, he was told that he was going to get uh, um, to see the Messiah before, um, before he died. But rather than just simply being this moment where he gets to see the Messiah, you know, um, in, which is the surface level reading, and he says these words, Lord, now you let my your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. You know, he says these words, but I want you to think about the significance of this moment from the perspective of Mary being the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus being the presence of God. Israel has been without the Ark for over six years hundred years. This is the first moment when Jesus is being presented in the temple that the Ark of the Covenant has returned to the temple. The first time in 600 years. Why did Luke decide to include this moment in there? Well, it's because everything that he is talking about here, from start to finish, every story that he tells about Jesus is to show that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus is the presence of God. And there's only one other story that's told, and I've often wondered this about to, to myself. Why is it that of all of the stories that could have been told about Jesus' childhood, that we talk about the one 
where Jesus comes to the temple again as a 12-year-old is because I believe every story that, we, that Luke decided to tell, out of all the stories he could have told about Jesus' life, every single one he told was in order to prove this point. Mary is the Ark of the Covenant, and Jesus is the very presence of God. Because, next slide, the finding of the child Jesus in the temple is that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, they go to Jerusalem, they're there for a feast, and they're, they're on their way home, and they're in a big caravan filled with lots and lots of people, and they lose Jesus. They're like, oh my gosh, where is Jesus? We've lost him. And so they, they spend the next three days looking for him, and they can't find him, and there's significance there in three days of losing Jesus, and then finding him again. It's kind of like a resurrection type, you know, uh, 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 analogy right there. But what happens is, is where do they find him of all places? They find him... In the temple. And Jesus' words to them, you can see them as the words of a, 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 a pubescent child who is starting to like talk back to his parents. Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? What a jerk thing to say to your parents, right? You know, after you run away, like, can't you apologize? No, but what he was saying in that moment is I want you to think about the double meaning of those words. It's his father's house because his forefather, King David, was the one person who was allowed to call God his father. And so when he's saying, did you not know I would be in my father's house, he's saying, speaking of his own kingship, saying, did you not know that I would be in the house that my father built, the temple in Jerusalem? But I want you to think about the other meaning as well. This is my home. This is my father's house. This is where I belong. Because didn't you, haven't we already figured this out a long time ago that you are the Ark of the Covenant and I'm the presence of God? Isn't that where the presence of God belongs? Is it the temple in Jerusalem? And so rather than being the words of a jerk 12-year-old to his parents, he's saying something about how he is the Ark, that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant and he is the presence of God returned to the temple. Every choice that Luke made when talking about what stories to tell about Jesus' childhood were trying to prove this point that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant and Jesus is the presence of God that was contained within her. Next slide. Oh, there's much more to say that we're not going to get into. I want to tell a few ones, um, just a really few fun ones, because it's not just in Luke's Gospel. You start to see this all over the place, but um, in John 1, it's talking about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there is this moment where he says, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt is such a terrible translation in English because the word is eskinosin, uh, and what that means in Greek is to fix one's tabernacle, to have one's tabernacle, um, or to abide and live in a tabernacle or tent. And so Jesus literally, according to that word, pitched his tent among us, the tent of meeting. John saw it too. The cleansing of the temple, all of a sudden, you know, like if you start thinking about any time that the temple is talked about, these things take on new significance. Um, you could talk about the destruction of the temple, the predictions of the destruction of the temple. You could talk about the temple veil being rent asunder at Jesus' death. You can talk about so Jesus' words uh, to the woman at the well when, you know, the, the woman who had, been, uh, had had five husbands. Woman, believe me, at this hour, the the day is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. All of these things are talking about the temple, and all of these things have significance that we're not going to be able to talk about. But next slide. I just want to talk about two last things, and I've mentioned both of these already. And the first one is, if you remember, there was the eastern gate, was the gate that uh, King David brought the ark through. And what ended up happening was that that ark was considered sacred, or excuse me, that gate was considered sacred because because King David had entered through, because the ark had passed through, nobody else was allowed to pass through it. And the belief was, or the, the idea was, is that when the, somebody walked through that gate again, the next person who would do so would be the king of Israel. It was held sacred for him. So when Jesus is riding in on that donkey, which, by the way, if you read the story of King Solomon and his, uh, his uh, coronation as king, he was riding on a donkey. It was a sacred act that was happening there. 
or it's something that was uh, that was reserved for the king of Israel, that particular right. Jesus rides through where in the Jerusalem? In through the eastern gate. And so what happens is, is that it's not just the Messiah who's passing through that gate, the king of Israel, it's also the presence of God that is passing through that gate. Mind blown. Okay, next slide. And I, I talked about this because you might as well we've gotten to this point. You know, we've talked a lot. Um, one of the, the great things about talking about Mary's perpetual virginity is, I mean, it, a lot of the good arguments against it, they're very easy to understand. But when you look at the church's tradition, you realize that once you start getting over those initial objections, it looks like Mary had other children, you know, it said that, you, you know, the brothers of the Lord, all that. Once you get past that, you start reading the scriptures. There's so many different things that are pointing toward the perpetual virginity of Mary. And the one is, if you have a gate that the Ark of the Covenant passed through, and that was so sacred that nothing else was allowed to pass through it, if Mary is giving birth to Jesus, isn't that the same kind of thing? Don't you think that God would hold Mary's bodily integrity as something that was also sacred that nobody else was allowed to pass through? I mean, so, like, I'm not the person who's, you know, coming up with this. Uh, St. Jerome mentions this very thing when he's, in a letter against the Pelagians, he's speaking of, the, first of all, the Eastern Gate, which was also set apart by use of the King of Israel and the Ark. Mary's body was also set aside for her sacred use. No other man save the King of Israel is to enter her. Those are the words of Jerome 1,600 years ago. Both of these are in the Old, our Old Testament types. In other words, the Old Testament is... Uh, hidden in uh, the, the uh, Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. The New Testament is hidden in the stories of the Old Testament. All right, next slide. I think that might be it. I think that's it. Okay, so we basically have seen that, I mean, Luke was very clear about this. I have one last thing to, to tell you this here. Is one of the ways, you know, like in English, we have quotation marks to show when we're quoting somebody. And so if you want to know who the, the witness is, that you would have this is that, well, so-and-so, you know, a reporter would write this. Well, I was talking to so-and-so. They are the chief advisor to President so-and-so. And these are the words they said. Quote, words, unquote. And that's our convention in English of how we show that somebody is speaking. In ancient times, they used very different syntax, syntax than we did. The way that they would show who the, uh, the uh, witness was who was reporting these things is that they would say their name at the beginning of a section. You know, well, and so there was a woman uh, who the angel Gabriel appeared to, and her name was Mary. And then at the very end, they would mention their name again. So at the very end of the story of finding Jesus in the temple, it says, and Mary pondered all of these things in her heart. It, she was the witness. Who was Luke talking to to get all these stories? He was talking to Mary about these things. And what were the things that Mary was pondering in her heart? She was pondering the fact that she was the Ark of the Covenant. She's our, our chief theologian in the church about this entire thing. She had 30 years. By the time Luke and all of the disciples were coming to her saying, Mary, we, we understand that you probably know a lot of things about Jesus because you've had 30 years to think about this. Could you tell us about your understanding of how, how the scriptures relate to Jesus? She's like, yeah, I'll tell you. I'm the Ark of the Covenant. You ever thought about that? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's literally what this is saying. And I, I don't, like, it's just so incredible. I don't think I've ever been able to read the Gospel of Luke the same way again. And hopefully you won't be able to read the Gospel of Luke the same way ever again either. Thank you. So I've got 15 minutes. 15 minutes to for questions. Sure. Um, I guess I could talk to uh, our secretary Anne, and we can uh, we can get this online. Um, I don't know. We can maybe put a link in the bulletin or something like that. Look for the link next week in next week's bulletin, and we will. Um, we should that should be available.
Is there a real gate? Well, I mean, not anymore, because the Temple of Jerusalem, Jesus predicts this. He says uh, within basically a generation of his, his death, the Temple of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. And so there is no, there, right now the only thing that's left of the temple is what we call the Wailing Wall. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, I mean, they, they've got the Wailing Wall. They have a person who is reading the Psalms, a rabbi who's reading the Psalms, and he is chanting them. And it's the way that the chant is made, it sounds like weeping. It's very interesting to hear it. But anyway, so the temple being destroyed, the whole idea behind it was if the, the, the temple was supposed to be kind of like a, a type or a foreshadowing of Christ. Um, now that the symbol no longer serves its purpose because Christ exists and he's now like the new temple, he's the new Ark of the Covenant, he's, he basically predicted it, be, it needed to be destroyed because it's him now. And when he, Jesus says that you, don't, you won't be uh, to the woman at the well, you're no longer going to be celebrating on this mountain or in Jerusalem. He's saying, essentially, is you'll be able to celebrate everywhere because, well, he's now in every tabernacle throughout the whole world. Every Catholic church has the Ark of the Covenant within it. Isn't that great? You ever thought about your church that way, that your church holds the Ark of the Covenant? It holds the Ark of the Covenant because it holds the very presence of God within it. The slide with what on it? Oh, yeah, the map. Uh -huh. So I can't remember the map. I was really just showing where the Philistines were. Um, I'm not sure if it was called Gaza back then or not. I think it was called Gaza. I, I, feel, I feel like I remember, um, yeah, I feel like I remember seeing that sometime in the Old Testament. I'm not sure if they just took a modern map and they said, and this is where it was, so, yeah. So you're talking about the Crusades and that they were looking for the Ark of the Covenant or... So you're asking, so the, the, the Crusaders came in, they were trying to preserve the holy sites uh, so that, you know, they wouldn't be destroyed, and with, what in particular are you asking about? Did they have any involvement with the Ark? Did they have any involvement with the Ark? I'm not really sure, I mean, because of course the Ark is still lost in history. You have all sorts of history channel shows, conspiracy theories about where the Ark is now or anything like that. But I, I'm not sure if they spent any time looking for the Ark. I, I'm sure that there was a lot of holy spots and things that they were they, they searched out because um, they had to figure out what to preserve and what they what not to preserve. So, but yeah, as far as I know, probably if that's if they were actually looking for it, that would be something they were they were trying to protect. But I'm not sure in particular. Why did what? I mean, there's, there's this, uh, I guess there's a couple reasons. It's first of all, I mean, I guess the Jews who don't believe that Mary is the Ark of the Covenant, because they don't believe that Jesus was the presence of God, I'm sure they very much want it back. Um, you know, so I guess that's one reason why people are still looking for the Ark of the Covenant. The other one is, if it still existed, um, that would be kind of cool. You know, that, I mean, like, what a historical artifact that would be to actually know what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. Um, but in reality, I think you're right. I mean, there's a reason why the Ark of the Covenant was lost to history also. It's because it served its purpose as foreshadowing Christ. Because once you finally got to the New Testament, just like the temple got destroyed because, well, Christ is now, like, the temple. Um, so the same way the Ark of the Covenant. I think it's fitting that the Ark of the Covenant got lost because it was... We, we have a new symbol of it.
So, um, so we'll repeat the first part. So do other religions see Mary as the Ark of the Covenant? Um, it's an interesting question. We have like we have a few Protestants in here, former Protestants. I don't know about Gary, like what they talk about. Now he's kind of shaking his head. I mean, I think that the ones who, who do so, they might be they might be willing to say that, you know, like for instance, Jesus is the very presence of God. Um, but as far as all these connections with Mary, I think they tend to shy away from those things. Um, but yeah, every once in a while you'll see a, a Protestant scholar who acknowledges that. Typically what ends up happening when you see people who are dabbling in Catholic things is that they end up Catholic. I mean, Gary was the same way. For him it was uh, Catholic spiritual direction was his big thing, is that he, he tried to bring spiritual direction into his Protestant circles, and they're like, well, let's just call it like life coaching. You know, they, they didn't really have that concept of spiritual direction. As soon, and it was still a 20-year road for him, but... Um, but yeah, oftentimes when you start dealing with these very Catholic things, you start to, uh, you're like on your road to being Catholic anyway, so. Yeah. Okay, anything else? I'm gonna give a five count. <laughs> and bye. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Father Paul, for the lovely talk. Thank you to everyone for coming. There are more donuts if anybody wants donuts for a year or two ago. Um, and yes, if you have any further questions, or thank you to Parish Council for sponsoring today's faithful coffee. If we could give a round of applause for that. And we got our donuts for KMA donuts down where Dominus used to be across from Gearbirds. So, and everybody have a lovely Sunday. Thank you.